Hello again, I'm Scott Spiker with More Realty in Vancouver, Washington, and this is the last video in our series on real estate and finance. In this particular episode, we will go over some final considerations when looking at real estate from an investing standpoint. So if you want some ideas on funding for your next real estate project, or you have some ideas and questions as far as getting loans, for your next real estate investing project, stick around for real estate investing part two. All right, Scott Spiker here with uh, more realty and Cascade Living. And in this final episode of our home finance uh, and real estate investing, we have Austin Irwin from Director's Mortgage here. Austin. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Austin Irwin with Director's Mortgage. Have uh, seven plus years in the business. Plus, I have a team that's dedicated that is four decades of experience. So it's a, a great opportunity and we love what we do. We also have experience in owning property, uh, being an investor, plus helping investors attain their real estate goals. So I'm really happy we're covering this topic today. Nice, yeah. And in regards to that, this investor series um, video number two, um, and so we'll just get right into it here. Do you loan on both single family residents and multifamily? Yeah, so we'll lend on uh, one to four units. Anything over a one to four units, we're gonna be looking at commercial financing, which is a completely different animal. It has different requirements from what we do for one to four unit. But really, if you're a star, if you're starting out in real estate, you're most likely gonna to wanna to be jumping into a single family or a small plex two to four unit to start building that rental portfolio. Once you get that experience, maybe you expand into other uh, investment opportunities, but it's always good to have a good foundation. And a foundation typically starts with a single family and then moving from there. That's personally my philosophy as an investor. No, it sounds really good. Um, and then for the seasoned investor, there's like um, LTV and ARV, which is loan to value ratio and after repair value. Um, and how does that work on refinance loans? Yeah, great question. So let's just say you were buying a property and you're doing a 20% um, down payment. Your loan to value will be 80%. Now let's say that appraisal comes in uh, $20,000 higher. Well, you're walking in $20,000 in equity, but we can't change your loan to value off of that. So the parameters that we said are gonna be your loan to value. Whereas if you're doing after repair value, well, maybe you're doing like a fix and flip product or you're doing a 203K loan, something like that. It depends on the loan program that you're using and the investor that you're working with that they may count that um, after repair value in your loan to value. So it's really important to have that conversation with your lender and every lender is gonna be different when they're looking at loan to value and after repair value. Okay, so if I'm reading you right, then you guys pretty much base everything on an, an, a like an appraisal price or a purchase price or exactly. So we're going to okay. be looking mostly at the purchase or the purchase price first, and then once that appraisal comes in, we're going to see because the appraisal is going to dictate the true value of the home. Okay. Or at least the opinionated value of the appraiser, which we will go off of. Okay, and that that might change, right? I mean, if somebody found a like a hard money lender they bought a property that was needing some work and then they did the work on it and fixed it up and then went to you for um, like a refinance on that to pay off the hard money lender. Mm -hmm. So then that would be based upon the, uh, the appraisal at that point, correct? Exactly, okay. so a lot of investors like to do the Burr method, right. which don't quote me on this, but I believe it's buy, uh, rehab, refinance, repeat. So if you're gonna use a hard money or soft money lender to get into that deal, and then you have rehab costs that, let's say you spruce it up, new kitchen, new bath, whatever it is, and then you come to a lender like myself and say, hey, I wanna do a cash out refinance, well, we're gonna get an appraisal on that property. Right. We're gonna take that into account. So you have that higher loan value. Nice, okay. Um, so for seasoned investors, let's say they've been at it maybe you know for a little while, 
What's the max lending limit or aggregate for any one investor? I mean, is there a ceiling like debt wise or number of properties or how does that work? Well, I guess Fannie Mae states that you can have one to four units. After you have four units, you're gonna to go to Freddie Mac. Freddie Mac is uh, five to 10 units. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are the two conglomerates of conventional financing. Okay. Once you go beyond 10 properties, now you're in non-qualified mortgage territory where you're not gonna be capped on the uh, amount of properties you have financed. But there's gonna be uh, not as great as terms as conventional financing. There might be prepayment penalties if you wanna pay a property off. Mm -hmm. So these are all things that you wanna talk about your lender with. And those are things that we cover because we have both not only standard financing, but those non-qualified mortgages for investors. And there's even what's called a debt service loan, where if you're an investor and let's say uh, you don't have W-2 income to show or we can't qualify for a traditional mortgage, well, if you wanna buy an investment property, uh, you can look at putting 20% down, and as long as the rents cover the mortgage payment, that's all that matters. Ah, nice, okay. Um, and then, uh, do in-house loans get reported to credit bureaus if it's under like the name of an LLC or a business? I mean, does that affect your personal credit or is it based pretty much on the entity that you've started your investment proceedings under? No, it all depends. I mean, properties will show on credit report and there's a lot of, I mean, I get investors asking me this all this time, can I put the property in LLC? Personally, I can't advise you on that because I'm not one, a real estate attorney and also um, a CPA. But that being said, there may be ways for clients to put a mortgage into a LLC and mm. most likely they are going to report on the credit report because it's going to be tied to you in some way, shape or form, but maybe not. Right. Okay. So it can, it's variable yeah. basically. Um, and then, I, I don't know that we necessarily address this, but on the refinance loan, uh, how fast can that be turned? And what can people do to help that along? On the refinance mm -hmm. to uh, get the cash out? Right. I mean, on the refinance then, you're gonna do anything that you would do like on a purchase. You're gonna get a loan application, we're gonna gather your supporting documentation, right. and they're gonna tell us how much cash you're looking to take out or what are the refinance goals. Typically a refinance takes 30 days or less to complete, okay. so it's very quick. And if you're looking just to lower your interest rate, you're gonna be doing a rate and term refinance, or if you wanna take cash out, we're gonna be getting an appraisal on the property to dictate how much cash we can take out with the equity that's there. Right, okay, perfect. Um, and then, uh, do you guys have a process where there's a max lending limit that needs to be approved um, to border co committee, and what's the what's the limit there? Well, it all depends on the loan that we're doing because the conventional loan limit, like we've been talking about in the videos, is six hundred forty-seven thousand two hundred in the Portland Metro. And if you go beyond that, you're going to do a jumbo loan. Jumbo mm -hmm. loans can go all the way up to three and a half, five million. So, mm -hmm. I mean, depending on what you're looking to do, um, you're really going to have enough bandwidth, at least in our market, if you're buying a one to four unit property. Typically, if you're going beyond three and a half or five million, you're looking at an apartment right. or a commercial building. So, right. there are going to be caps on the different loan program, but you probably shouldn't hit that for it to pencil. So that being said, it kind of depends on the program and the property. Right, mm -hmm. okay, situational. All right, um, and then what, is there primarily a differences between residential and commercial products that way? I mean, is it is it mostly interest or how does that, how does that vary? Well, it's gonna vary on a lot of scales. Uh, if you're doing a, a residential one to four unit, you're gonna be qualifying with debt to income. So where is your current income to all your con uh, consumer debt plus the mortgage? The down payment requirement is gonna be most likely less than a commercial loan. And you're gonna be looking at probably just going through the straightforward process that you would on any kind of conventional or any consumer home loan. Whereas commercial financing, they're not really looking at you as the borrower, they're looking at how the property performs. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm not a commercial lender, I don't mean to speak for commercial lenders in general, but right. I have experience, because my family and I, we've dabbled in that field of owning commercial. Mm -hmm. But they look at the property more than they look at you, the down payment requirement's different, and so it's not so much you, it is the property on commercial. Whereas residential, it's all you, right. and it's really not the property. Right, 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 okay. Um, so is there anything else that we kind of missed or something you would like to add that maybe you think people might need to know 
um, as far as like a sort of a closing thing? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> if you're looking to start an investing career, you're already an experienced investor, there's a lot of great opportunities out there still in this market with rising interest rates, high appreciation. Like we've been talking about, uh, real estate's a great way to hedge inflation. You get tax write-offs and benefits. You get uh, appreciation and cash flow. So there's a lot of great ways to create wealth through real estate and having experienced advisors like you and I can help and make all the difference from buying the right property instead of the wrong property. And so definitely having an experienced team on your side will really help. And personally for me, when I look at my real estate portfolio, for the most part, it's been going up. And on down years, I still have that cash flow coming in and I still get those sweet tax write-offs. So it's a great way, whereas I always like to say, if you buy a stock for $100, and let's say that stock got a 10% return. Well, I just made, and I, let's say I bought it for $1,000, right, at $100. And I would get a 10% return on that, 100 bucks. Awesome, great. Whereas real estate, if I bought a house for 500,000, and I got a 5% return, well, I just made $25,000 with my tenant paying down my mortgage while getting cash flow and a tax write-off. Right. There's more of advantages to that real estate than there is to that stock in this scenario, but there's no right or wrong reason for an investor if they want to stay in real estate, stay in the stock market. As long as you're investing, you're doing good. All right, sounds good. See, um, I think I'm gonna get like a graphic from you as far as like contact information and that kind of thing. Um, so it's okay for people to give you a call or contact you if they have any further questions, right? Oh, definitely. Reach out to me, love to help. Okay, sounds good. Hey, Austin, thank you for being part of this series. And um, we'll post that information so people can get a hold of you. And again, thank you. And folks, um, looking forward to seeing you in the next episode of Cascade Living.